Have you ever wondered, what if Jesus hadn't come 2,000 years ago? What if he had come today, in modern times? What if Jesus had been born in Bethlehem in 1990? And so now, 30, just over 30 years later, he's out starting to do his ministry. How would people respond? How would I respond? It's easy to think about that, and you start to think, man, we we live in a sophisticated age. We've got all this technology. Surely if I, surely if the people in our culture could see Jesus, could see him do these miracles now, you know, if we could YouTube feeding of the 5,000, right? And if we could hear him preach, surely we would respond differently, right? I mean, people can't be that thick, can they? And then you start to think about it, and you're like, well, actually, maybe they can't. Because you look out at a world that is losing its mind, it seems, more and more every day. And you see people that are very hostile to Jesus Christ. And you think, well, I don't know that it would end different. But even as you think more about that, and you think, well, this world, and even our society, that's headed just in this crazy and progressive liberal way... And you think, yeah, they're hostile to Christ. They would be. I think the effort to kill Jesus would be more bipartisan than you think today. Because I think it would be people from all walks of life, from all kind of viewpoints, uniting together against Jesus. And why do I think that's what would happen today? Because that's exactly what happened 2,000 years ago. You had people from all different walks of life, people with different worldviews coming together and putting Jesus on the cross. The Son of God, the King of Kings, was right here. They saw Him do the miracles. They heard Him teach, and they still put Him on the cross. How in the world did that happen? Why do I think that would still happen today? Well, the Bible's going to show us. We're going to see more of the religious leaders. We're going to see more of Pilate and what motivated them. And we're going to see some of those motives are the same 2,000 years later. We need to listen so that we don't end up rejecting Jesus today. So let's take our Bibles and let's open to John chapter 19. We finished John chapter 18 last week. And as we did, we saw kind of part one of the drama between Jesus and the Jewish leaders and then bringing him before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. And today we're going to see part two of that drama. And what I want us to do is look at each of the main players in this story. Let's look at the Jewish leaders. Let's look at Pilate. And let's consider Jesus. And especially as we look at those first two, how is it that they miss Jesus? How is it that they crucified the Son of God when he was right there in front of them? How did they miss it? And let's start with the Jewish leaders. And we see a lot from them in the first seven verses. Let's look at those together. John 19, verses 1 through 7 says, Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he made himself the son of God, right? I mean, verse 7 should make the hair on your arms stand up a little bit. How could they possibly say that? How could they have the son of God right there in front of him and say that he deserves death? How does it get there? Let's look at more of that passage that we just read. It begins with Pilate taking Jesus and flogging him. And we see from the other Gospels, it seems that they mention Jesus being flogged after he was sentenced to death. And this is likely a scenario where he was flogged now, and then he was 
flogged again after he was sentenced to death. There were different types of severity of kind of a beating that the Romans would give to a prisoner. And let's just be clear, you don't want any one of them, okay? Uh, They're all bad, but this was most likely the least severe of them now, where the third and most severe was really a precursor to crucifixion. It's let's beat this person up so bad that the process of them dying has already begun. And that's likely what happens to Jesus. It's not out of the kindness of the Romans' hearts that they let someone else carry Jesus' cross, okay? It's because he was so beaten up, he likely didn't have the physical strength to continue to do that. But Paul, or Pilate, he has Jesus beaten here, and we see the soldiers kind of taking the charge here. Now, as you think about soldiers and military men kind of throughout the world and throughout history, obviously and thankfully, we have some incredible examples of bravery, courage, and honor, people fighting for what is right in a way that's right, but also you you see people that are uh, wicked and brutal and savage and enjoy the violence and the brutality just because. And I think that is unfortunately what we see here in verses 2 and 3. I mean, these are brutal, wicked soldiers who I doubt care at all about who Jesus really is. They don't care about what he has said. This is sport for them. This is entertainment for them. And they get into it. They mock him. Uh, They take this crown of thorns. We don't know exactly what that looked like. It's possible it was the thorns from a a date palm, uh, which could be very long thorns, up to like 10, uh, 12 inches Long, So those could dig deep into Jesus' head, but also kind of fashion them to curl out so it almost looks like this crown kind of has this radiant glow to it. Just to add to the mockery, they take a purple robe. Purple was the color of royalty, and they put it on Jesus um, and mock him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, as they strike him. Right? This is an awful scene, but what's, what's the point? Well, we already know that Pilate does not think Jesus is guilty. We saw that last week. He says it multiple times this week. So likely what he is trying to do is say, okay, I don't think this guy is guilty. I don't think this guy should die. Maybe we can make this all go away if we just beat him up and then release him. And I think that's really what he's trying to get to, to appease the Jews. And I think that explains the scene in verses 4 and 5 where Pilate makes it dramatic, right? I'm bringing him out to you. And then Jesus comes out with this crown of thorns, with this purple robe, and he says this dramatic, yet almost mocking statement, behold the man. I think what Pilate is trying to do here is to present Jesus as a pitiable, almost pathetic figure and say, behold the man, really, guys? This is who you're so worried about. This is who you're all riled up about. Look how pathetic I can make him look. Can we just move on with our lives and get over this? But does that satisfy the Jewish leaders? Do they say, yeah, you're right. He looks pretty beat up. Let's move on. No, they cry out, crucify him, crucify him. They are out for blood. They will settle for nothing less than death. And now Pilate, again, he's frustrated, I think. And that's why he says, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. He already said that in what we read last week. And he knows they can't do that legally. They're not allowed to take somebody and put them to death. And so then we get back to the shocking statement of verse 7, where uh, really it's, it's one of the many scenes that we see in the arrest, the trial, the crucifixion of Christ that is dripping with irony. They say, we have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. Now, likely what they are referring to is Leviticus 24, 16, which says that the penalty for blasphemy is death. And and that verse says that, but then the irony is, is that what Jesus was doing? He made himself to be the son of God. He was the son of God. Of God. And it's ironic how they started off. We have a law. What was the point of the law? To point to the coming Messiah. So here, 
they have missed the entire point of the law and are now using the law to do the very opposite of what the law was all about to point to the Messiah. They missed the whole point of it. And again, there are so many people today that want to take the Bible, take what we see here, and they completely miss the point. They don't see that this is pointing all of us to a Savior. Point number one this morning is we consider the Jewish leaders don't miss how Scripture points you to a Savior. Don't miss how Scripture points you to a Savior. If you think that the Bible, or if you think the Christian religion is going to affirm you as a righteous person, or give you some kind of roadmap to how you can work it out and become righteous, then you have missed the point. You have missed the point of the Bible. You have missed the point of the Christian religion. And even they talk about the law. The Bible talks about what the law was meant to do. Let's look at these verses in 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy 1, verses 8 through 11. We'll put that up on the screen for you, it says, now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Now, let's just be reminded there, we're not trying to throw the law under the bus. It says right there, the law is good. And if you're reading through Psalm 119 with us, we'll get to all kinds of great statements about the law. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. But if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So there he makes it clear. The law is not laid down to make you feel good about yourself. And the law is not laid down just to show you how you can be good and become acceptable to God. The law is here to show you your sin. There's two images that I want you to think about that I think really the ways people view the law are really what the Bible teaches or the ways of Christianity. Some people, and I think this is the Jewish leaders, and unfortunately many people today view it as a ladder, right? That, hey, this is giving me the things I can grab onto and I can climb my way up to be acceptable to God. By keeping these rules, by doing these things, I can become right with God. But what the law in actuality is, it's a wall stopping us In our tracks. It's a wall saying you cannot get to the other side because you are not just. You are unholy and profane. You are ungodly. You are lawless and disobedient. That's what the law, especially when we think about the use of the law for those that do not belong to Christ, that is what it is meant to show. That you are a sinner who needs a savior. And that's why this wall, it's not just a wall, like the whole wall has this big arrow on it saying, yeah, you cannot get past this, but there's a way that you can. There's an arrow pointing to a gate of Jesus Christ, saying it is only through him and what he has done that you can get through. And then I would say, well, when we go through that gate, the Bible makes clear we get a new heart. God says he will write the law upon our hearts. And now we view the law not as a ladder to climb to get to God, but as a path that this is the best way to live. This will protect me from all the dangers of this sinful world. This is a good gift from God to show me. But when it comes to un Believers, the law is meant to show us our sin. Don't misuse Scripture. Don't misuse Christianity. If you're expecting those things to affirm you as good or to give you some path, some ladder to climb to be good with God, it does not work, right? And it it doesn't make you not unholy or ungodly. You are still stuck in Sin. That's what the religious leaders were. Did Jesus think, you know, especially even when he says things like, hey, you have to have a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. 
Did Jesus think the Pharisees and the Sadducees were righteous people? What do you think? No, absolutely not. You can just listen to these verses, but Jesus tells us what he thinks about the religious leaders in Matthew chapter 23. And he he rails on it for the whole chapter, but let me just read some of it, starting in verse 25. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, yet inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So also outwardly, you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So even there, we, we, we see him calling them out and saying, you're putting up a good front, but inside you are full of hypocrisy, you are full of sin. And even he's trying to show out like you can't even fully conceal your sin because you are self-indulgent. When, when you think no one else is seeing, you're doing whatever it is that you want to do. And what's ironic is then he goes on to say, and you build monuments to the tombs of the prophets saying, oh, if only we had been alive, right? And, and as they say that, they're the ones that are going to kill Christ. And if you are trying to use the scriptures, if you are trying to use the Christian religion to make yourself better, it will not work, just like it didn't work for the Pharisees. They, didn't, they weren't actually righteous guys that, oh, they just forgot about Jesus. No, they were unrighteous, selfish, sinful people. And, and if your faith is not in Christ, and you're using scripture instead, you're missing the point and using it to justify yourself uh, it's going to be impossible to hide your sin. Because all we would have to do is peek into your home, peek into your finances, peek into your internet history to see that inside you are full of hypocrisy and uncleanness. And if you're realizing today, I am one of the people that Jesus is calling out. The outside of the dish looks good. And for some of you, that might even be why you're here today. You're here to make that outside look good. And you intentionally come here this morning to look good and to make it look like you have it all together. And so your neighbors can know, well, that person goes to church, but inside is full of death and sin. And if that's you, the solution is not try harder, do better. Here's a few more rungs on the ladder. The solution is Jesus Christ and him crucified, that he took our place. Turn with me to the book of Romans. I want us to just do a quick overview of these first three chapters. And if you come to this church long enough, you'll probably find once a year or so, we'll probably end up turning to Romans 1 through 3 because we need to hear it. Because it reminds us of the purpose of the law. It reminds us of really the problem that all of humanity has. How there is not one single one of us who can use the Scripture or use the Christian religion as a ladder to climb to God. It does not work. It says in Romans 1, verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven and all ungodly, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And then the rest of Romans chapter 1, it's actually kind of creepy, that it goes on to read like Paul is describing American history over the last 100 plus years. Saying, well, these people, God gives them up and they ignore creation. And then they, they'll have a sexual revolution. And then they'll have a homosexual revolution. And then they'll just be given over into all kinds of sin and foolishness and faithlessness and heartlessness and ruthlessness. And you're like, how did they know that's exactly what would happen? And also, I know I'm speaking here this morning to a very conservative slice of Idaho. And we're all looking at this kind of as an out there problem, saying, amen. 
That's sad, and it should grieve us. It's sad to see our culture living out this wrath of God, living out this being handed over to their own foolishness. That should grieve all of our hearts. But then Paul does something. He pivots. He's been talking to, all right, let me talk about the pagan Gentiles and how the wrath of God is coming upon them. Chapter 2, all right, now let me talk to you religious Jews. And I don't know why you guys got to be the pagan Gentiles this morning and you guys are the religious Jews. But you're going to see it's not going to work out for either of you, okay? Because he pivots from these people who are very open with their sin and their lawlessness to these people who think that they are religious and that that makes them better off. Chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Hey, you want to knock them for their sexual immorality and their greed and their covetousness? Really? You're going to tell me there's no sexual immorality, there's no greed, there's no covetousness in your life? You're perfect? Oh, wait, actually, you do some of the same things you expect them to be judged for? That makes you a hypocrite. But you think you're better off, he goes on to describe, oh, you you think you're better off because you have the law, so you know some things, and you've been circumcised, so so you've got that going for you. But he says, no, that's not going to work out. And in verse 16 of chapter 2, he talks about this day, According to my gospel, when God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Hey, their sin isn't so secret over here. They're out in the open with it. But hey, all of you religious people, you've got sin. You might be better at keeping it secret. But guess what? Someday, God's going to judge the secrets of men. And knowing the law and having been circumcised aren't going to do you any good on that day. But I highly doubt that there's some of you that think, well, I have some scripture memorized or I've been circumcised, so I'm going to be okay because of that. But I think there's a lot of people today that think, well, I'll be okay because I'm an American or I'm not an atheist or well, I go to church and I haven't, I've never cheated on my spouse or, or been divorced. I've you know, raised my kids and provided for them. I'm not a part of this cultural revolution that's going on. I mean, come on, I live in Idaho for crying out loud. And I go to church, I give to the church, right? Not one of those things is a bad thing. But not one of those things can save you. And it gets to the punchline here, really in chapter 3, verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? Religious Jews over here, is it any better for you than the pagan Gentiles over here? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all Both Jews and Greeks are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. And then it gets down to the end, verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For the non-Christian, the law is here to shut you up. And to show you, you're a sinner who needs a Savior. Verse 20, for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And then he goes on. That's the the pivot point then of the book of Romans. So far, it's been the problem. Then he gets to the solution. Jesus Christ. He is our substitute. And we receive that salvation not by works of the law, but through faith. But he spends the first three chapters trying to show, hey, the whole earth has the problem of sin and not one person will get things right through the works of the law. And to be saved, you're going to have to admit, I am a sinner who needs a savior. And I honestly believe, especially in our culture, if you get down to it, that is the number one objection to Christianity. And it's good to, you know, think about apologetics, and we'll have discussions about, well, is there a creator, and this is why we believe Jesus rose from the dead, but I think there's a lot of people in America that are willing to buy those things. There's still a lot of people out there that look around and say, you know what, I don't think this just happened. And there's a lot of people that believe, yeah, there has to be 
a God and they're willing to believe that Jesus came and that he died and that he rose again, but where they're going to choke is admitting, and I am a sinner. I am a wicked person and I need to be forgiven because if not, I deserve God's judgment and hell. That is a hard thing for people to swallow. And that is why I think if Jesus came today and he started pointing out people's sin, they would say, crucify him. Because they would rather kill Christ than admit that they needed a Savior. And that's where, again, I want you to consider yourself. Are you missing the point? And even the reason that you're here today is this is another thing that you were doing to be made right with God, or have you come to the point where you have humbly admitted, I am a sinner who needs a Savior? And for those of us that have, we can look even at things like we read in 1 Timothy about being unholy, profane, ungodly, sinners, lawless, disobedient, and we can say, and such were some of us. But we have been washed, we have been justified, we have been sanctified through Jesus Christ and what He has done for us. The point of the Scripture is not to pat us on the back. The point of the Scripture is not to, hey, here's all the stuff you got to do and all the boxes you got to check to be good. It's, you're a sinner, but Jesus is the Savior. And then there is great value in God's Word as we put our faith in Christ, and this is how the King wants you to live. And as we started saying more, do it our friend in Uganda, there is a King and His way is the best. So now let's live and follow the way of our King who gave Himself for us. It's what we see kind of in these Jewish leaders. But as we go back now to John 19, the drama is going to shift back to Pontius Pilate. The drama shifts back to Pilate even when they say he has made himself the son of God. So far they've been emphasizing, hey, this guy says he's a king. And hey, that, that's a problem, right? Well, now they mention what's really getting at them, that he makes himself to be the son of God. Well, that puts something new on Pilate's radar, and let's read how that plays out in verses 8 through 16. It says, when Pilate heard this statement, that Jesus made himself the Son of God, he was even more afraid. He entered the headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king! And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them, to be crucified. And here again, we see some of the religious leaders and some of Pilate, but it really shifts back to Pilate when it says he became even more afraid. Now that's interesting because it implies he was already afraid. And we talked last week even about so much of the political pressure that was on Pilate. But now, in addition to the political pressure that is already making him afraid, it seems now he has some religious or supernatural or possibly even superstitious element that is making him Afraid. I mean, if you ha have any knowledge of Roman or Greek mythology, you know it's full of stories of the gods kind of coming down and being among men, or the gods coming down and producing offspring uh, that then lived among men, right? And so, hearing that he is a son of God, who knows exactly what that meant to Pilate? Uh, but very easily in that culture and his worldview could have done something to make him afraid, potentially, of who Jesus was. And so he goes and he asks him, where are you from? Now, there, there's no way for Jesus to kind of give a simple answer to Pilate there without having to 
deconstruct his whole worldview, right, of this poly- polytheistic pagan culture. The, the kind of answer that he would give would not really make sense uh, to Pilate there in a moment. He remains silent, and Pilate then, he flexes on Jesus. You know, we saw him last week try to flex on the Jewish leaders, Well, now he tries to flex on Jesus, saying, hey, don't you know I decide who lives or dies, right? And, and Jesus then responds with this amazing and powerful statement in verse 11 saying, uh, you would have no authority over me at all unless it was given you from above. And I think even pair that with Jesus' statement last week saying, my kingdom is not of this world. I think Jesus is not being so subtle saying, you would have no authority unless I gave it to you. And then it's interesting, he says, therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Not all sin is created equal. All sin is sin and it's bad, but he even says the greater sin is the one who delivered me over to you. I think likely referring to Caiaphas, the high priest, or maybe more broadly to the Jewish religious leaders who should have known better. They weren't steeped in Roman mythology. They had the law and they missed the point. Obviously, he does not say that Pilate has no guilt, um, but then we see Pilate still. Now, he wants to release Jesus. We already saw him say that, right? I find no guilt in him in verse 6, and now it's saying he, he wants to release Jesus. Pilate is convinced that Jesus is not guilty, that he does not deserve to die. So how does the only guy there who even said himself, I have the authority to release you, how does that not happen, right? Well, we get then back into the drama in verse 12. And back, I think, a lot to the political pressure. Because the Jews cry out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Now, again, we're seeing the full hypocrisy of the Jews. Because do you know who the Jews could not possibly care less about? Caesar. But now they're trying to use him. It's, It's hypocrisy. But that phrase, Caesar's friend, or friend of Caesar, we know by at least 40 years later, that was an official term. Like if you were a friend of Caesar, that was like an official title, an official important thing. We don't know if it had reached that status uh, already in this time, but still you get the idea of what they're saying. Saying, hey, if you let this guy off, you're going to be in trouble with Caesar. And there's a couple things that probably make that really hit home to Pilate. First, Pilate had been mentored by this one guy who was higher up kind of in the Roman system than he was. And not too many years before this happens, that guy gets on Caesar's bad side somehow. And Caesar at this time is a very paranoid and very brutal guy. And if he starts to think you're looking sideways at him, it's not going to go well for you. You're likely going to end up dead. And that's what happened to Pilate's friend who was a friend of Caesar. And so there's that probably in Pilate's mind. And like we talked about last week, the Jewish leaders have already shown, hey, Pilate, you mess with us, we'll go over your head and complain to your bosses. The bosses who you need their approval to get out of this, what you Romans think of as God-forsaken place in Judea. And so they're bringing all this pressure on him. And it seems that that is too much because then Pilate goes to the judgment seat and what's he going to do there? He's going to wash his hands of it And he's going to deliver Jesus up to be crucified. His fear and his concern for his own well-being and his own position wins out over what he knows to be right and true. So on this Friday morning, so we get from the day of preparation, it's the day before the Sabbath, right? He goes and he gives this judgment. And now we see the full breakdown. Every time you see him saying, behold your king, shall I crucify your king, right? He's giving in to their demands. But let's be clear, Pilate hates these people. And the feeling's pretty mutual. Him and the Jewish leaders, they hate each other, but they are together putting Christ on the cross. And so when he's saying, behold your king, shall I crucify your king? He's just trying to rub it in to them uh, of what they're saying about Christ. But in the end... He, he gives him up. And the Jews say the worst thing that they say at the end here, we have no king but Caesar, right? Earlier they're saying, we have a law. Well, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And now they're giving up the Lord who should be their king to, we have no king but 
Caesar. That was not just a political statement for them to make. That was a forsaking of everything the law pointed them to say. And he delivers him up to be crucified. As we think about Pilate, number two, don't fear man, respect God's authority. Don't fear man, respect God's authority. Pilate does something he knows he should not do because of the pressure that's brought about upon him. And he ultimately feared man more than he feared God. Even though hearing that Jesus was the Son of God was enough to make him afraid, it wasn't enough to make him do what is right because that fear ultimately didn't overcome the fear of the Jewish leaders, the fear of Caesar, or whoever else. And there's a lot of people throughout history and a lot of people today, and I'm afraid a lot of people in the future that will end up missing Jesus because there's something else that they fear more. There's someone else's approval that they value more. Jot down this reference, Matthew chapter 10, verses 26 through 33. As Jesus is training his disciples to go out, he says, have no fear of them. Basically talking about the people that will persecute you. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you have whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, for you have more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. And he makes it clear. He's expecting us to stand For him, and he gives us reasons, one is the fear of the Lord. Don't fear man, there's something more frightening than them. God can destroy both your body and your soul in hell. But he also gives us not just the fear of the Lord, but the care of the Lord. God cares for you. If he cares for the sparrows, you're more valuable than them. He knows how many hairs are on your head, which is easier for some of you than others, right? But he knows how many there used to be, maybe. Uh, he, he, He knows every intimate detail of our lives. He cares about us. And so we don't need to be afraid. And that's a word we need to hear because what is it going to be when it comes down to I can follow Christ or I can keep my job? Or I can follow Christ or I can keep my life? What will you do in that moment? And again, that's where many of us, we want to say, I'm not going to deny Christ, and we need to stop. And it was like, yeah, remember two weeks ago, who else said that? How'd it go for him, right? We don't want to be arrogant, thinking I'll stand. We want to be humble, and yes, resolved to stand for Christ, but also realize many of us have never been put in that situation, and we probably haven't even fully thought through the cost and the weight of what that would be. And I don't think we anticipate how evil the world can get and is going to get. That just the fact that you agree with Christ and you are saying what the Bible says will make you unacceptable to the world. And I think we want to think, well, you know, I can make myself acceptable to the world and still be faithful to Christ. Someday the world is not going to give you that option anymore. It won't matter how culturally sensitive or kind you are. It won't matter how for the city your church is. It won't matter how trendy or slick or cool you are. If you are going to say what Jesus is going to say, you're unacceptable. That's the way it's going to be. And are you going to stand with Christ or the Bible or not? And that's where this week, that won't be the situation that most of you will be in, right? And it is a lot easier to stand for Christ in a hypothetical situation than it is in a real one. So I want you to focus on what are the real ones this week. Because for most of you, It won't be my job or Christ or my life or Christ. But there will be situations where you feel pressure to do something that you know is not the right thing to do. It might be people in your office. Well, if we just fudge these numbers just a little bit, well, that's okay, right? Or the pressure to, well, I mean, 
people will like me more and, you know, I'll actually be more effective in sharing the gospel with them if I just laugh at this joke, right? And you'll be tempted to rationalize and manipulate your own thinking into doing things you know are not right. And if we're doing those things now, we're, we're setting ourselves up for failure in the future. If the fear of man controls you, you are a slave, right? Pilate was a powerful political man, but in this moment, he was a slave. He was a slave to the fear of men. One writer put it this way, every person you try to please above and beyond what is allowed by the scriptures becomes your captain and your conqueror. Who, who are you giving that power to this week because you care more about pleasing people than you do pleasing the Lord? It's easy to look out at the, again, the wicked culture. It's easy to look at the pagan Gentiles over here and say, hey, when they pressure me to give in to sin, I'm not going to do it. But there's probably people that you actually like, people you value their opinion, and they might pressure you to do something. Are you going to stand there? But as we think through Pilate, we think through the religious leaders, right, the Son of God is literally standing right there in front of them in the flesh. The King of kings and Lord of lords is right there. And they crucify him. I think they do it because they miss the point of the law. They, they do it because they, they have bigger concerns. And I want to make sure that we do not miss Jesus. And so just as we wrap up in a few moments here, let's consider Jesus, kind of the third character here. And remember how Pilate presents him, right? In, especially in verses 4 and 5. He tries to present Christ as someone to be pitied. And everything that we see happening to Christ is horrible. It's terrible. For the, the crown of thorns, the mockery, the beating, it's all wrong. And we might be tempted to feel sorry for Jesus. Well, no one ever got saved by being good, no one ever got saved and got to heaven by successfully navigating all the political pressures of life. And also, nobody ever got saved by feeling sorry for Jesus. Jesus is not looking for our pity. He's looking for repentance and faith. He's looking for us to turn from our sin and worship him. Jesus here in this passage, he is a victim of all kinds of injustice, but he is not a helpless victim. He is there, as we've seen time and again, because that's exactly where he planned to be. And he did that so that we could be saved. A helpless victim cannot help you. And Jesus did this to help us. He had pity on us and gave his life for our sins. Point number three is we consider Jesus, don't pity him, praise him. Don't leave here today feeling sorry for the raw deal that Jesus got Leave here today praising Jesus for what he did to save us from our sins. If you are going to follow Jesus in this life, and even someday if he calls you to follow him in death, pity isn't going to get you there, right? Only a true worship of Christ as the Savior and the King will. I mean, consider again what Jesus says in verse 11, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. He was not helpless. He ended up on the cross because that's where he wanted to be. And why did he not give Pilate more answers? Why didn't he say more to justify himself? Well, because that was a part of the plan. And perhaps one of the most famous prophecies in all the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He didn't make an answer because he was the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And we see more of that in the few verses before that in Isaiah 53, starting in verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. 
And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We need to praise him as the Savior. And again, the hardest part is going to be admitting that you are a sheep who has gone astray, that needs that help. Have you admitted that? And if you have, we should leave here today with real humility, remembering I didn't climb over the wall. I didn't climb the ladder. Christ died for me. And that is my hope. And then we should praise him not just as the Savior, but as the King. He is the one who has the authority. And like we saw last week and the week before and the week before that, right? Jesus Christ is in control. And we can praise him as the king by trusting him this week, by trusting that his plan will be accomplished. And that even though the world seems like it's getting darker and darker, there's a lot to look forward to because Jesus is the king and he is in control. And also we should praise him as the king by living for him and leaving today saying, you know what, every situation I'm in this week, you know what my number one concern is? Pleasing King Jesus. It's not ultimately about pleasing anybody else. It's about pleasing him. Jesus Christ was not born in 1990. He was born 2,000 years ago, but the Bible makes it clear, you know, this hypothetical, what if Jesus came today? Well, he is coming back. But when he comes back this time, it's not going to be like a lamb to the slaughter. He is going to come as a lion to claim his kingdom. And the only way to be ready for that day, the only way for that day to be a good day for you is to understand really the significance of this day that we've been talking about today. That Jesus is the Lamb of God who died for your sin and not to pity Him, but to worship Him as the Savior and the King. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do want to come before You humbly this morning. The point of Your Word makes it clear. The law is there to shut all of us up. To make it clear that not one of us is good enough. Not one of us can justify ourselves by the work of the law. All we like sheep have gone astray. All of us have turned aside to our own way. But you have laid the iniquity of us all on the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. I pray that we would rejoice in that today. And God, I pray for those that are here this morning, God, that they are still seeking to do it themselves. Or even they are here this morning to polish the outside of that dish, God. That today would be the day that they admit, I need a Savior. That I am an ungodly, lawless person. And no matter how much polish I put on the plate, I can't clean the inside. And help them to put their faith today in the one who changes us from the inside out. God, and we see salvation in this house today as people call out to you. And God, strengthen all of us. May we worship you. You are this, Christ is the Savior. Christ is the King. Help us to be so much more concerned with what he thinks than anyone else. And prepare us to stand for you, God, no matter what. And God, we thank you that Jesus endured the cross and endured the shame that we deserve so that we could be saved and reconciled to you. We praise you this morning and all God's people said, amen. amen.